we're all here for you to get some information about the engineering process specifically today for the research and development and cost analysis. He is a Electrical, electrical engineer. Yeah. Um, he is part of that research and development process and cost analysis at Kalo. Um, and he'll introduce a little bit about Kalo, Kalo and introduce a little bit about his job and how they go about the research, development, and cost analysis process. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for having me here. This is probably the first time that I've been able to speak to a high school group, so if you'll bear with me and if you have any questions or if I'm getting boring at any time, uh, please feel free to nod off or uh, raise your hand, whichever the case may be, whatever the mood moves you. Uh, first of all, let's, uh, let's kind of get an idea as to who I am. Uh, as you can see from this list of uh, uh, years on here, I've been around as long as your grandfather. So that gives you an idea how old I am. Uh, the, uh, presently, I'm working, as uh, Joe said, with uh, Kalo Technologies. I've been there for about six years. Prior to that, I spent six years in retirement. Uh, you may wonder, why am I going back to work? Well, sometimes you uh, find yourself uh, wondering why you retired, because what I like to do is to in do engineering work and in an uh, industrial environment. So I was kind of lost when I, when I retired, and I decided, well, I've got to get back to work. And uh, so I looked around in the newspaper, found nothing, and then a friend of mine told me about Kalo, and I decided to go back there and take, do an interview. And, uh, Fortunately, they had some work for me to do, and uh, I've been there for about six years. Prior to that, I, prior to my retirement, I spent one year working for my son in uh, construction. Now, if you can imagine, no, you can't. You can't wor imagine working for your son, so I won't try to get into that too much. <laughs> it's a very strange uh, <laughs> uh, relationship. Uh, so, uh, and then six years prior to that, I worked for a company called Timekeeping Systems in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we built uh, security systems, guard tour systems. If you are aware that uh, guards uh, travel around they, uh, their uh, sites, their industrial sites, and they have to check, make sure doors are shut, nothing is out of place, and uh, so on, and they have to record when they've been there. We built systems that would take care of that. I worked for one year, actually two times, I worked for Gould Medical and uh, working on their, uh, some of their systems there. I worked as a contract engineer for them. Uh, six years I spent with uh, DCOM. We did computer peripherals. That was a, uh, uh, that was a very interesting time. Uh, I worked on the hardware. I had two other engineers that worked on the software for those systems. And I spent two, three years at Allen Bradley prior to that. Uh, Alan Bradley, as you may, may know, you may have heard the name, they uh, build electrical fixtures, big boxes, big contactors, and controllers that are used for uh, controlling industrial uh, processes. I uh, spent four years at Picker International, uh, worked on the first uh, CT scanner and the first MRI scanner that was used there as, uh, their medical, in their medical division. I was involved with the computer side of that. I built the interfaces for the, uh, for the computer to the uh, scanners. And then I spent 17 years at Dartmouth College. And you wonder, why did I spend 17 years? Most people could do it in four. Uh, actually, I was employed at, at Dartmouth right out of the Air Force. And uh, I uh, worked for them in the physics department doing research and uh, uh, building equipment for them, designing electrical, electronic equipment, and so on. So that kind of gives you a, a handle on it. One year at, at a TV shop and then four years in the Air Force where I went to electronics school. Uh, we've come a long way in electronics. Anybody have any idea what that thing is? <laughs> I thought probably not. <laughs> That's an operational amplifier. And it has vacuum tubes in it. And if any, you know, I think about vacuum tubes, they uh, take a lot of heat, they uh, generate a lot of heat. 
and uh, not very stable. This is a circuit that I designed. I own a uh, 66 Mustang. And I was looking at all the new Mustangs, and I said, oh, that's, they've got lights that, uh, the taillights that flash. They, when they put on the directional things, they go blink, blink, blink. I said, that looks like fun. So I built this uh, PC board. And on here is an operational amplifier by today's standards. And that's, a, that's pretty large compared to what you can get. Uh, so that, that kind of gives you a bit of background into what I do. Um, now let's talk about Kalo. Kalo is a company that's located in the industrial park in, uh, uh, Claren in Clarendon near the airport. And uh, we're a contract manufacturer. Contract manufacturer works for other companies. We, we uh, contract uh, with them to uh, build a piece of equipment that they have. Most of our business is done with a company called Sealed Air. You're all parent, probably aware of uh, sealed air products. If you've ever gotten a package in the mail that contained bubble wrap, that was probably made on one of the machines that we make, the bubble wrap. If you look on it, if you look on the bubble wrap, if you're ever curious or anything, you might see that it says sealed air. Uh, there are other companies that do it, but they are probably one of the largest companies. And we build the machines that actually uh, do that. I'll show you one of those a little later on here. We have about 50 employees at Kalo, and uh, it's a very, um, very good atmosphere to work in. I, I, that was, that's one of the things that impresses me. We, everybody seems to get along quite well with each other. There isn't a lot of politics going on there. Our sales are about $12 million a year. That translates to about a million a month that we, uh, we have in sales. And we have a profit sharing plan with that, a bonus plan, if you notice there on the bottom line. Uh, a part of that, the, part of the uh, uh, profits each month are divided up among the uh, employees, depending on your salary and your rating among the uh, other employees. Each employee gets a rating sheet, he rates all the other employees in the company. So this kind of makes everybody want to work together well with other people. So they, they, uh, people try hard to uh, do a good job at what they're doing because that's going to affect their bonus uh, at the end of the month. How is the company organized? Okay, there's, there's a number of things. I won't spend much time here, but there is always a management uh, group that takes care of that, the president and uh, a vice president. Uh, finance, we have a uh, lady that takes care of that portion of it, a receptionist we have in there. The engineering department is comprised of five people. We have two electrical engineers, uh, two mechanical engineers, and uh, our supervisor, who is a, also a mechanical engineer. Purchasing, they take care of, all, obviously, all of, the, all of their uh, uh, buying. Uh, we buy parts for anything for production. They are involved in that. They're taking over more of that for, uh, for engineering as well. We used to do a lot of our own purchasing, but we're getting so that uh, purchasing is now taking care of a lot of that uh, aspect of it. Manufacturing, that's a very important part of our business. That's the part that makes the products that we sell. So there, we try to make it in engineering as easy for manufacturing as possible. We provide all the documentation that they need, how to build a machine, the build uh, procedures, and so on. And we try to make it as easy as possible for them because otherwise we're going to have to build these machines. So it behooves us to uh, make good documentation. Sales, obviously, uh, that's going out and looking for new customers that we can w do our work for. Shipping and receiving is on the, in the warehouse. They, uh, they're the ones that bring stuff in, inspect it, in the receiving, yeah, make sure that what we ordered is what was what we have in our uh, uh, in our shipment, and uh, then we have product support, which all of our parts that we or all of the products that we make, we support them in the field. So we have to have a department that does that, that takes care of that. Okay, getting down to products. This is this is our main product right here. This is called the Cyclone. And what it does, it makes bubble wrap. Now, what you're seeing here in the machine, it also makes pillows like you see here. And uh, if you, I can point a few things out here. A picture here, there's a 
sealed across there, across there, so it makes a pillow. And then this blue area right here is where the air gets blown into it to blow it up. And then this wheel here has a heater in it that seals that edge, so it provide, makes, a, uh, makes a pillow. So that's, uh, that's our main, main product. We build it in an assembly area, and as you can see, they start from this end here, right down, I'll get my arrow here, right down this end here, start putting the machines together, and uh, works down the uh, assembly line, each person doing it, and it finally ends up in final assembly. Okay, we lost electricity, I guess. <laughs> Ends up in final assembly and then uh, final test, where one of the uh, one of the engineers that's his job. He does all the final testing on the on each machine. As you can see underneath it, it has a uh, a sample of the bubble wrap that was made with that particular machine. So the paperwork and that bubble wrap is kept with that machine through final test. What happened here? I'm not From there, it goes out into the warehouse for packaging and uh, put, to be put in inventory. Uh, we have this uh, stack system in the, uh, in the warehouse that takes the boxes that these are packed in, these are all lined up getting ready to be packed, puts them on here, and then there's a motor-driven uh, rack system that takes them in on this end and they go out on the other end. So it's a first in, first out uh, kind of system. Okay, now let's get down to the nitty gritty of what I came here for. Uh, we'll call it Engineering 1, I won't call it Engineering 101 because we're not gonna have more than this one day. So Engineering 1, uh, in engineering we come up with an idea or our sales department has a customer that has an idea that they want us to uh, uh, do. So together with uh, that and with the necessary tools that we have, the CAD systems and so on. We have uh, SolidWorks, which is a uh, mechanical CAD system. We have uh, electrical CAD and Eagle uh, software that we use for our electrical CAD. And uh, whenever we do any uh, project like that, we uh, get together a team. Now, maybe one of the electrical engineers and one of the mechanical engineers, or depending on how we, how, what the mix is for the project, it may be two of, two of the mechanicals and, or two of the electricals. So it just depends what the mix is for this particular project. But we have a team that works together on the, uh, on the design. And that involves uh, uh, perhaps in the case of a uh, panel that we just got through building for a company uh, over in Denmark. Uh, they had, we had to design the, uh, the, the cabinet that it went in, and then I had to design the panel, the electrical panel that went in that. Uh, so we end up with a, with a product, and then there's always at the end there's some waste. So you have to figure out what, what you're going to do with the waste, how is that going to be taken care of. So this, okay, engineering principles. We want to get into the meat of why I'm here. Uh, first of all, there has to be a need. The, uh, the first thing a uh, customer comes into our, our uh, building or into our business, and they have a need. They want something built. They want something designed, perhaps. And then uh, they, they, perhaps they've done the marketing on it. Perhaps uh, we've done the mar we do the marketing to find out what volume we're, going to, we're talking about here. What, is the price range that would, this product could sell in. And so those are the, those are the kind of things that we, we need to uh, find out from uh, need. Then we have to find out, is it designable? You know, can this, what they have an idea for, is it possible for us to design it? Uh, we have certain limitations in our company. We, uh, uh, we don't try to do everything uh, we, we, there are some things that we do really well. We have the skills in-house to do those. And uh, so we have to decide, you know, can we even do this project? And if we, if we can, then we have to find out, uh, is it manufacturable? Can we make it in the volume that the customer wants to, uh, to get? Uh, and then the packaging. 
we have to put this into some kind of a package so that it can be shipped to the customer. In some cases, it's a, uh, shipped on a, uh, uh, on a pallet. We uh, build, up the, build up around on the pallet uh, a box around it so that it's well protected, padding put in there, uh, sealed air, bubble wrap <laughs> is probably used in there most often. And then what is, now that we've got down, we've got all these uh, things in there, we found out is it is manufacturable. We found out how much it's going to cost because we have a bill of materials that we've developed. We've uh, found out how much manpower it's going to take in, in uh, production. And then uh, how much is the packaging going to cost? And is that going to make it affordable? We have to make a profit. Uh, Probably the uh, customer that we're building it for is going to resell it to his customers, and he may, needs to make a profit. So is it competitively priced? Can, is this going to be something that will fit into the marketplace uh, for that? Going back to need here, um, one of the things that we need to be very careful about is make sure we understand what the customer wants or what the customer needs. If you look to start up in the upper left-hand corner, this is how the customer uh, explained it. Uh, the next one shows how the project leader understood what was being said by the, by the customer and how the analyst designed it, how the programmer wrote it, what the beta testers received for the, uh, for the uh, sample, of course, how the business consultant described it in glowing terms with the sunset in the background, and how the, uh, down in the next row, how the project was documented. In this case, not very well. Uh, uh, what operations installed, all they got was a rope, but the customer was billed for a very fancy system. And how it was supported was probably based upon how much documentation there was. And what marketing advertised but this is what the customer needed. He didn't need anything very fancy. He just needed a rope and a tire. So we have to listen to the customer. We have to, and in fact, we have to make sure that we understand what it is. Going back to designability, is it designable? Uh, here's some items that I've picked off the internet that I found perhaps aren't too designable. You know, if you follow the, uh, the lines down from here, you'll find it ends up in a rod. That looks good. But then you find this one doesn't work so good, and this one ends up in space. So this is one of, those, one of those things. You can draw a picture of it. You could probably even get it onto a CAD system, but you can't build it. It's not, not something that's designable. Same with the triangle. If you look at that, you'll notice that that's uh, uh, not very, not, not, con not conce yeah, con there's not a conceptual way of building it. Manufacturability. Okay, you've got this thing designed, this cabinet, this electrical box, and so on. Now what? Can we manufacture it quickly? The importance for manufacturing something quickly is so that we can reduce our inventory. If you, keep, if you can think about uh, bringing in all these parts that you wanted to build it with, and then it's going to take you six months, all that money that you've purchased the parts with is tied up in inventory. It's not making you money at all. You're not getting anything out of it. The idea of running a business is to uh, turn that money around so that you can then sell it and make money off it. If, if you're going to have to uh, wait a long time for your money, you're probably not going to make any in the end. Can it be manufactured in large volume? If the requirement is that we have to build a, long, a large number of these, then uh, we're going to have to uh, be able to manufacture it. We have to have a uh, floor. Welcome. <laughs> and we're going to have to manufacture a lot of these in, in high volume and uh, produce them uh, in a way that uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can handle. And we have to make sure we have the manufacturing space uh, to do that. So that's part of, uh, that's part of uh, quoting the job that the customer comes in with. And is quality going to be compromised? Is there other reasons for uh, uh, that 
we can't build the best widget, whatever it is, uh, that, that is possible. And is it going to be economically competitive? Are there people out there that are already making a similar product? And are they pricing it in such a way that we're not going to be able to compete with them? OK, now we're getting down to where we're designing the product. We've decided we've, uh, we, we can do this job. Uh, Sales has written up a contract with the, with the uh, customer, and now we get to design it. So we have an engineering team. We have uh, both mechanical and electrical, as I said. We have the tools and power tools, shop, hand tools, so on, in, on hand to do that. We have the specifications that the customer has signed off on on the contract, and we have management support. We have the personnel and we have other resources. Perhaps we have to buy some tools to, uh, to be able to do this particular uh, project. Now, the time constraints, as I mentioned before, are very important. And the, we need to set up a schedule for doing this job. And then uh, we'll have deadlines that we have to meet. Uh, we can't, can't just let it go on forever. We have to keep within our time constraints. Because time, as you probably have heard, is money. I earn a certain amount per hour. The company charges a certain amount of my, for my time each hour. And I can't waste the customer's money uh, taking too long on a project. Again, the cost constraints we have are, are determined by whatever the consumer pricing is. And we have to uh, be able to stay within those uh, constraints. And quality requirements, which we get from the customer's specifications, are things that we have to uh, pay attention to. We have to make sure that we're doing a good job in uh, keeping the business, uh, um, uh, keeping the product within those specifications. OK, there is a quandary in, in engineering. And part of that is, is determined by this triangle. Uh, there's high quality. Obviously, that's what you want. You want to keep the cost down, and you want to deliver it quickly. Well, there's an uh, axiom in engineering that you can have two of these, but you can't have three of them. In fact, you can have any two you want. Pick two. You can have any two. You can't get the third one. And that's probably, pretty, uh, probably a pretty good axiom. And we have to be able to uh, fit within that and decide how much of that third one can we, uh, uh, can we continue, or uh, can we uh, perhaps cut corners on a little bit? Uh, you can have high quality and low cost, but you can't get those quickly because the low cost to get the high quality is going to take your time. You can't have low cost and get it quickly and then expect to get high quality. And you can't have it quickly and high, high quality Low cost is not going to be very easy to do. OK. High quality goals. Obviously, you would want a product to have good quality. You want it to meet all the customer's specifications. In fact, you'd like it to exceed the customer's specifications so he is extremely happy with what he gets. So we need to define the project very well. We need to know what our team's strengths are. Pers people have Different people have different skills. Um, my skills are in hardware design, uh, software design, of a, uh, working with uh, basic and uh, uh, basic programming language, uh, basic compilers, cross compilers. Uh, Dale, who's my cohort uh, there, he's the other electrical engineer. Uh, he's good at programming uh, programmable logic controllers, PLCs. Uh, he's very, very good at that, and uh, that's, that has quite a background in what Picker has been, uh, has, is a good part of the background of what Picker has been doing uh, over the years. And so he's very good at that. And uh, we cross uh, talk a lot just so that we know what the other one is doing and what those skills are that we can, we can use and pick each other's brains over that. 
So once you know the, st the team's strengths, you can uh, assign people to certain tasks on there. And then you do a very careful design. That's, that's probably the most important part of it, is working very carefully, uh, keeping your errors as, as few as possible so that you don't have to do a rerun on the design. We use the best parts that we can available. If you're going to go for high quality, we, we don't uh, cut corners on that. Uh, we have multiple design reviews. In other words, we meet together with the other engineers and go through the design, pick it apart, uh, and see what can be improved, what's, what, uh, what perhaps is wrong with that design. And then we document it very well. Every step of the way, we document what we've been doing. And that, that, that's very time consuming. It takes, takes a lot of time. Perhaps, perhaps half of the time or more is spent documenting what you're doing. So the cost of uh, high quality means that you're going to have a long design cycle with all those tasks that I just mentioned. Uh, you need to have prior knowledge of the personnel involved. And you need to check that design at every step, as I mentioned. You're going to be building it with probably the most expensive parts or, as, or expensive parts. And because of all of this, you're going to have a long time to market. And it's a high cost is passed on to the consumer. Low cost goals. Uh, here we limit the project planning. We don't try to do as much as we can. We limit the personnel. In other words, if we don't put two people on it if we can do it with just one. That cuts down on the cost. Uh, we limit the design time. We keep uh, uh, project reviews to a minimum. And we design with less expensive parts. If we can find something that costs less, we use that. And that's. That's one of the goals that we have, because we're in a market that's competitive. There are plenty of other people out there that would be willing to sell something. In fact, we are competing with uh, Chinese manufacturers. And as you probably well know from shopping at Kmart, most of the things you buy there are made in China. And it's no different in our business. But we have to, so we have to keep our designs low cost and uh, try to keep, uh, so we have to balance off high quality with the low cost, keeping documentation to a minimum. Product quality, of course, is, uh, tends to be compromised there, and the consumer cost, but the consumer cost is reduced. Sales and market shares our potential is higher, because if we can produce a par produce a product that is uh, less expensive, we can market it in a larger market, and the profit margin is potentially higher. Because we're not, because we've already reduced the cost of it, we can sell it at a at a margin that allows us to uh, make more of a profit on that particular one. Quick goals: uh, we want to get the get the product to the market sooner than the competition. That's one of the main goals of that. And also, the sooner we get that product to market, the uh, we're going to increase our sales for this quarter. And guess what? That fills my pocket, because that's where the bonus check comes from, from those sales and profits for this quarter. Quick results. The lower quality is going to be less competitive because of quality. It's more competitive because of price, but it's less competitive as far as quality is concerned. Less design time, less documentation. Now, this works on some products. But you, can, you can do it with minimal amount of documentation. Uh, because, of the, because we have to order parts, we probably have to get them in overnight. That means we're going to have high shipping costs. Uh, we're probably not going to be buying in high volume. Uh, so we need to, we need to uh, bring in our, uh, our, product, or our parts uh, at a higher price. If you buy parts, for, you get a, 10 of them, you get a higher price than if you bought 500 of them, say. Uh, and it's less time for researching parts. I can't sit down and spend all of my time trying to find a part that uh, is less expensive when I need to get this out the door. Okay, now, getting down to your project. Uh, I assume that this is what you're going to be doing. Is, am I correct? 
Okay, green cleaners. You go out and have bacterial cleaners, a glass cleaner, and a hand cleaner. Okay, in order to do that, you've got to do many of the similar things that we do. You need a management team. You need leaders on that team, and you need to identify people who have those skills, and you need to assign those people to a particular role, and you need to delegate authority, who can, people who can delegate authority. So, uh, you need people who are good at finances because you need to buy things. They need to be good at planning. They keep an eye on expenses. There are some people among you probably that just love finances. I don't, but uh, I'm sure there are some of you that do. And then you need to maintain records to see how much this is going to cost because no matter what you make, it's got to be something that can be sold and be competitive in the marketplace. Okay, what kind of people are chemical engineers, or any engineer for that matter? I just put this down because this is what you do. Uh, they're inquisitive. They have an innate curiosity about things. When I was uh, in junior high, um, I was always taking things apart. I have radios, pieces of radios laying around my room. I had watches that I took apart and couldn't figure out how to put back together. And it was this innate curiosity that I had about how things worked and how could I make it work better that uh, drove me. Can do attitude. Uh, don't give up. You know, that's one of the things about being an engineer is you have to have an attitude that you can do it. It can be done, and that's, uh, that's very important. The other thing is persistence, is keeping on with whatever you're doing and being sure that you can uh, continue doing, let doing it and making forward progress and knowledgeable. It may, it may be that what you're learning in the classroom isn't going to be enough. You may have to uh, sit at your computer and Look, through the, look over the internet and find out uh, how to go about doing something. I do that all the time. I mean, I started out in business making things like this. I didn't make this, by the way, uh, but things similar to that uh, with vacuum tubes. If I'd stopped learning when I got out of the Air Force, um, I probably uh, would be swinging hamburgers at McDonald's today. By the way, McDonald's wasn't around when I got out of the Air Force. That gives you an idea how long ago that was. Uh, and you have to be able to work well with people on a, on a team because uh, there, are, uh, there are many tasks that need to be done and you need to get along with all the people that are on your team. Which brings me to a parable that I uh, think you might be interested in. In order to tell this parable, I'm going to have to revert back to a Vermont accent, which I've been kind of suppressing for the for most part of this talk. Um, it involved my grandfather. My grandfather was a uh, farmer, lived on a dirt road. In that, up that dirt road, he uh, he had a friend uh, who he uh, knew quite well. And so he, uh, one spring morning, my grandfather decided he'd go down to town. And uh, he uh, looked out the door and he saw there was a warm out. And of course, you know the first thing about getting out on the spring roads in the springtime is that they are muddy. So he says, I can't go down the road like that. I have to find some way of doing this. So he went in his shed, found a pair of snowshoes. He walked, he strapped on his snowshoes and proceeded to walk down the muddy road. As he was walking down the muddy road, he saw a hat laying in the road as he approached town. And as he got closer to the road, closer to the hat, he noticed that it was moving ever so slowly. Well, this got my grandfather's curiosity up. It being innately curious, he walked over to the hat and picked it up, and there 
Under, his, under the hat was his good friend and neighbor, Walter Wheeler. Walter, he says, you are in trouble. Walter says, no, no, Rob, I'm not in trouble, for I still have my horse under me. Now, what can we learn from this uh, parable? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but you can see, they, uh, Walter Wheeler was very persistent, and my father, my grandfather, was very curious and very inquisitive, very knowledgeable. He knew that in order to get down that road, he needed some help. So there's all those attitudes that are working into that story. And uh, I, th I think we can uh, call that the, call that the end. I'll now, are there, are there any questions that you have, might have? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. Can I, can I have your attention, please? Okay. What do you do if the people aren't doing the work? You give them a one on their rating sheet, and next quarter they uh, pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't need to. Uh, incentive. Money. Money is a great incentive. It uh, and. Uh, being liked by your fellow employees is a very important thing. And so if you work for a company that has profit sharing and uh, employee ratings, uh, you tend to uh, find that perhaps somebody will be uh, not so cooperative one month, but uh, they get the message or they're out of there. And that happens. I mean, the people that can't, can't work with other people are not there anymore. About two months down the road, they find out they're not getting any, they're not getting part of the profit sharing. Yeah, yeah, it's a great incentive. Uh, the other, the other part of that equation was this was a, uh, uh, Kalo was a uh, employee-owned company up until a couple of years ago, and I was, I've been working there now for six, six years, and uh, when we sold the company, each person who was part of that profit sharing uh, earned, a, uh, uh, earned a sizable check, let me put it that way. It was much larger than what I had figured on. So if you get a chance to uh, uh, join a company that has either profit sharing or is employee owned, that's, it's a great incentive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much.